Um, okay, so just real quick, this is going to be a very high level um, overview of uh, Elm. Uh, why you should care, a little bit of how to use it. Uh, it's going to go really fast. There's a lot cut out. I have about 90 minutes worth of stuff. And I'm not pulled out in 20 minutes, so <laughs> it's going to be uh, fast. Um, Morning. I, I'm opinionated. I'm expressing opinions about some languages in here. I'm sorry if I offend anybody. It's not my intent, but I do a lot of opinions, and I hope mine don't get too bad. Who am I? I am a programmer. I am uh, a 10 Y programmer. Actually, I'm a 38 Y programmer as of this year. Uh, I've been doing this a long time, but. Uh, pretty casually a lot, a lot of ways. And I have no doubt that everyone in here is at least as good, if not much better programmer than I am. So I'm not up here as an expert. I'm just up here as somebody who's seen a lot of stuff and wants to share it with you and hopefully spark your interest in it. Um, I love object-oriented programming, uh, especially really good object-oriented programming, pure object-oriented programming like Smalltalk and Ruby. Um, but I also love functional programming. And Elm is a functional language, and we'll get into that a little bit. And who are you and why should you care about this? Well, uh, you are a web developer. Elm is a web programming language. It's, it's for front end web development only. It is not a server side language at this point. You can't do native stuff with it at this point. Maybe in the future someday, but right now the Elm runtime it runs in a browser and that's what it's for. Um, you care about programming languages. So if you're programming Ruby just because it happened to be the one that you got taught or you thought maybe there were more jobs in it, but you know you could just be you could just as be happy programming in Java or C sharp or C plus plus or whatever programming language you have. Then this probably isn't for you. This is a this talk is is aimed at people who care about the language that they're doing and want to, and use that language for a particular reason. Um, and you don't have Stockholm Stockholm syndrome, right? A lot of people once they get their favorite language, it's better than everything else and nothing else matters. It's not Stockholm syndrome isn't really the right syndrome here. There's an, there's an actual psychological thing that we all have, which is once you've committed to a thing, it happens when we, buy a, when we buy a product or when we choose a favorite programming language or a car or whatever, we immediately start justifying that in our minds and we, ten, and we tend to, to discount the, the assets of other things and overemphasize the assets of the thing we love. You need to get over that if you're going to learn a new, be open to a new thing. Um, so what is Elm? Uh, it's programming language. It's a set of tools around that programming language. It's a runtime that runs that language in a browser. Um, and it's an architecture. So in this sense, I heard somebody mentioned earlier, is a lot of people conflate Ruby and Rails, right? Ruby is a language, Rails is a framework. Well, Elm is both the language and the framework. So in this case, you're right. They're, they're right when they do that. Um, so what is the Elm language? It's a small and very simple language. Um, you can pick it up, the syntax and the, and the structure of it very, very quickly, especially if you've had any kind of experience with a similar functional programming language in the ML family of, of programming language. It is a pure functional language, about as pure as, as you can get in terms of functional language. And I'll explain what that means in a minute. Um, it comes from, it's based on ML, um, and other languages in that, in that category are OCaml, F Sharp, Haskell, if you've had experience with any of those, the Elm syntax is going to look very, very, very similar to you. Um, there are no side effects in Elm. It is theoretically impossible to write them. I'm not saying you can't do it, but if, it, it is very, very, very hard to write a side effect in Elm. And I'll explain why in a bit and how you can still get stuff done despite that. It is statically typed, and if you're like me, that in, and you love Ruby for its dynamic things, the hair on the back of your neck went just went up in a little bit, but don't worry about that. It's okay, I promise. And it's compiled, and if you're like me, the hair on your back of your neck really went up when I said that. But again, it's okay. It is not like other compiled languages that you might be familiar with. Um, the set of tools that are around there, around there um, obviously the, the tools include a compiler, 
This is not your grandparents' compiler, or if you're as old as I am, it's not your compiler. It is not that, that old XKCD commercial of like with the guy sword fighting and the boss yells, hey, quit fooling around, and they yell, compiling. Yeah, that, that's not going to happen. The compiler runs very quickly. It's, it's very dynamic. And you can actually set it up to live compile your code as you're writing it. So you'll get compile messages and, and errors as you're saving it. The feedback loop with, with writing Elm is actually faster than the feedback loop with Ruby. Um, again, there's a, the compiler can be run in a live mode that compiles it each time you hit save on your, on your things. This compiler is so amazing. Okay, I hate compiled languages. I, I despise writing in C and C sharp and C++ and all these things where you, in Java where you hit this thing and you get the compiler and you get this stack trace full of errors and you got to hunt and this is, no. You'll hear a lot of people talk about pair programming with the Elm compiler. The Elm compiler messages are amazing. They come through, they say, oh, you've, I got this error. It looks like this. You meant, you, you, I think you meant to do this. As a matter of fact, here, and if you've got an editor, a lot of them will say, do you want me just to do that? And it will, and it will fill that in for you and, and fix it. it. It's also very much, I think of it like a pair programmer and also a set of really, really, really good unit tests. The, the cycle of, com of writing an Elm um, and, or, or adding a feature to, to an Elm program is very often you write this part and then the compiler tells you the next thing you have to do and then you do that and then the compiler tells you the next thing you have to do and then you do that and then, you, and then you're done. It's kind of almost a red, green refactor sort of a, sort of a cycle that you get right from the compiler. Um, Elm also includes a package manager. So you'll, again, from the R Ruby world, we think of this like gems. So there's a built-in package manager that, come, that, that comes with Elm. And the package manager is also really amazing. Um, in, it enforces semantic versioning. Because of Elm's statically typed and compiled nature, you can't, it, it knows if you've broken, uh, if your, if your new version is not backwards compatible with your old version. And if you try and load a, a package, a, a gem, in the, uh, to the package management system that is not backwards compatible with your old thing, it will force you to do a major revision on, it, revision on, the, on the version number. And this is amazing for you as a consumer because it means that you don't have to worry if when you're upgrading to the new version of that package, am I going to break my code? You're going to see right there in the number that you're going to break your code or not break your code based on the semantic versioning number of, of the thing. Um, the Elm runtime. Uh, the Elm runtime is the part of your Elm that gets compiled into your application and it gets delivered down the browser and it's the part that basically runs the event loop for your app. And it's also the part that handles all the side effects and talks to all of the dirty, nasty outside world, like web services and other Java, uh, JavaScript components in your app and um, whatnot. Uh, it's very small. It's very fast. The Elm architecture. So the Elm architecture is basically, again, it's the framework. Think of this as like the Rails ver uh, part of, of a Ruby on Rails app. Only in this case, it's, we're talking about strictly front end in, in the browser. It, it's, it's simple and it's going to be familiar to anybody that's coded in Rails or familiar to, in, in a similar pro, uh, framework. It, has, it uses model view update. Sounds a lot like model view controller. It is a lot like model view controller. Um, we're going to talk a lot more about that in just a second. Why should you care about this little programming language and why should you use it instead of another front end development? Uh, uh, framework and language like JavaScript in React or JavaScript in Angular or Ember or any of those things. Uh, two big reasons. It's delightful and it's reliable. This is from the front end, uh, front page of, of, the, of the Elm language thing. I've probably coded seriously in 20 languages and done at least Hello World and there are about more in maybe triple digits of languages. Out of all those languages, I can only think of two where the designers of the language 
said, I made this language because I wanted to make programmers happy. Ruby and Elm. Those are the only two. And it shows. It really, really shows. Um, that's not to say that other, you know, I'm sure that, that uh, Larry, when he was doing Perl, does stuff to make himself happy and make the people happy. And I'm sure that Gosling, when he made Java, does some stuff because it makes him happy. But if you look at all those languages, the reason they were made, there's all sorts of different reasons. You know, Java was meant to be more portable and more safe than C++. Uh, uh, Python was originally a teaching programming language based on ABC. There's all these different reasons. The reason that Elm exists, the reason that Ruby exists, was to make people happy. And then there's a second one that's probably at an equal level with Elm, and that's reliable. You, <laughs> the, it's almost a universal statement that you cannot get a runtime error in Elm. You can write bad code. You can write a code that sticks the person's age in their name field or whatever if you write bad code, but you can't get undefined as not a function. Can't, it, it's, it's nearly impossible to do it. I won't say it is impossible, but it's nearly impossible. And if you do get a runtime exception, you file it as a bug with the compiler. Because it, it's, it's designed to be safe. There's a company called No Red Ink that runs Rails on the back end and Elm um, stuff on the front end. They also do React and stuff. They have tens of thousands of lines, probably hundreds of thousands of lines of Elm code running in production. And they've had, for, for upwards of five years now, they've had one runtime error with Elm. Their JavaScript code gets in all the time. But they've had one with Elm. So some other reasons why Elm is good. It's, it's small, it's simple, and it's opinionated. It, Unlike a lot of the JavaScript world right now, which is big and complicated and seems to be getting bigger and more complicated every day, uh, the, the Elm is, is like this, that you can, you can really laser focus on Elm and, and, and learn it and know it well quickly. It's fast. It has great tools. We've talked, I talked a little bit about the compiler and, and um, that as well, there's other great tools that go along with it, and has a great community. It has a really great community, uh, accessible, open, easy to talk to, and friendly. Um, here's some vision fast, here's some benchmark uh, studies that were done. Uh, I don't know if you can read from back there, but that's Ember on the far left, React, Angular 1, Angular 2, and Elm. And Elm is significantly faster than, than those in this particular benchmark. It's small. The deliverables are small. These, these are downloads for, their, that's Vue, that's Angular, that's React, and this is Elm here on the, on the far, your far right. Um, almost a quarter the size of the, of the same code in Vue, the same functional code in Vue. Which if you're relying on your users to download web apps, that's not a bad thing to be, is a quarter the size. So why would you not, just, just to be fair here, some reasons why you would not want to use Elm. Uh, so if you do most of your HTML and, and functional rendering on the server side in, in ERB or Haml or whatever, um, then you don't really, and you're not writing client side functionality, then Elm doesn't have much of a point for you. If you're just doing what, you know, Hammer Hansen calls a sprinkling of JavaScript, and you're probably fine sticking with that. But if you find yourself turning to more and more, you know, sprinklings of JavaScript that start adding up into the megabytes, then maybe you want to look at this. Um, you might want to not want to use it if you use it does not interact with JavaScript well. It interacts with JavaScript, but it interacts with JavaScript the same way that it interacts with any external thing. It can pass data back and forth. But you can't like drop a JavaScript UI component into the middle of your Elm app. It is not, um, Elm is not like CoffeeScript or TypeScript or any of these extensions or wraps around JavaScript. It is not JavaScript. It compiles to JavaScript, but that's like saying that Ruby compiles to C code in the just-in-time compiler before it 
before it runs. It's, it's not, it, it's a side effect. JavaScript is bytecode in the Elm world. Um, you also might not want to use it if you happen to love JavaScript or ES6 or the undefined is not a function, TypeScript, underscore, Lodash, Vue, Redux, Ember, Yarn, NPM, Babel, or, and learning a new framework every other week as one drops on NPM, right? Uh, again, you can tell I have some opinions about those. But if you happen to have favorites in there and you see your thing you love, then by all means stick with it. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Elm architecture here just to show you what an Elm app looks like um, and how it protects you and, and, and keeps that, that, gets that massive reliability it does. And it does that basically by putting your app over here on the side and you have your browser over here on the other side and in between your app and the browser is the Elm runtime. And to talk to the browser, basically your app sends HTML to the Elm runtime and the Elm runtime goes out and talks and does that to the, to the browser. Now that's not terribly new these days. A lot of people have do that these, now with a virtual DOM. React uh, picked it up. Actually, Elm did it first, and React picked it up from there. And now I think Ember and Angular and all the rest of them pretty much do the virtual DOM thing of the one-way push for speed. However, they still allow you to interact with the DOM directly. Elm, your Elm app cannot interact with the DOM directly. You, it's, it's always a one-way push out there. When the DOM sends events back to the Elm runtime, the Elm runtime sends a message to your app. And your app handles that message by combining it with what it knows as the model and sending it to the update function. And then the update function updates the model. It gives you a new model that is now updated for, with, with whatever changes you've decided to make based on that message. That gets passed to the view function, which produces some HTML, which then gets sent back out to the virtual DOM. And that's basically the cycle of an LMAP. Now, there are some more things that you might want to do other than generate HTML. Sometimes you need to talk to web servers. You need to do AJAX calls. You need to find out what time it is from the system. You need to generate a random number. You need to get some stuff that seems unsafe in the functional world, right? Um, Say, for instance, talking to our nice, wonderful Ruby app up here on the server that has our API. In that case, you send, along with the HTML, a command. And that command gets sent to the Elm runtime along with the HTML and gets sent out to the server or to a JavaScript component that's running on, in your app or something like that. It comes back um, in with the message again, and the whole cycle starts over again. So what's that look like in code? So uh, this is just a very simple high-level overview of, of a basic Elm app. So Elm code are, based, are wrapped up in modules, very much like a Ruby module. It's just a, block, a, a file that's a block of code. It also provides namespacing. Um, you can import, a module imports other modules. So this, this, this module is importing a, another module called browser and a module called HTML. Browser is the main module that has the, the, the Elm runtime in it. And HTML is a module that we'll look at in a second that provides some view functions to help you generate HTML. Um, your application is one uh, function here called main. In this case, it's running the browser sandbox. There's a series of Elm steps that run. So the basic, the most simplest Elm application it runs is a sandbox. Up from there is an Elm element, which gets embedded in an HTML element in a page. Then there's um, an HTML uh, browser document, which it means your whole document of your HTML is, is, is um, the Elm app. And then there's application, which is the whole document, plus it, it puts in a router so that you can have uh, multiple URL-based uh, single page application. Each one of these things is just a slight extension of the next one. Um, and complication, and we'll see that in just a second. Um, and then you have a model um, that, that is, and the sandbox gets fed an initial, an initial state of this model. You get a view function, which is a function that takes a model and returns some HTML. And you get an update function, which is a model that, which is a thing that takes that model and the message, as we see over there in the graph, 
and returns an updated version of that model. And then if you have side effects where you have the command, where you need to add the command in, that just add, that we need to bump up to the element, which I said is the next one up on that, on that step. Your main app gets this thing called subscriptions so, they can, so it can listen, it sort of listens in a pub sub sort of way for, for events outside of the app. And now your model, your initial state has to include a model and that command message and your update function also returns a model and, and that. What is a model? Model is, is basically any set of data that you're gonna plug into the view. It can be as simple as a string or an int or a float. Most of the time, um, it's going to be a record. And a record in Elm is essentially what you would think of in Ruby as a hash or a struct. It's a key value pair that has a set structure to it. Um, and usually, you alias that to, uh, to a name. If you've coded in C and then type def, this is, this is going to look pretty similar to you. So this particular model, it's called, I call it model, that's, that's the um, tradition. You can actually name this anything you want to. Uh, this is, has three elements in it. It has one called letters, which is a string. It has lookup, which is, a, which is a, tuple, a tuple of a Boolean and a string. And it has words, which is a list of a string. A tuple is essentially like a, you can think of it in Ruby world, this would be like an array, um, that, but it's fixed and it has a set number and a, and of, elements. A list is, again, like an array. It doesn't have a set number of elements, but it does have a set type. It's actually a linked list, not an array, but close, close enough to Ruby for comparison. What's the view? Well, the view, again, is a function that takes a model and a message, and it returns some HTML, which in the view in, um, in um type is an HTML message. It's just a regular function. It's not a template. Um, which means that you can put any Elm code in there you want to, loops and conditionals and, and any other sort of things. Uh, it's composed of smaller functions. Those functions um, kind of make it look like Haml, more like Haml than ERB, but again, it's not a template, it's, a, it's an actual function. So here's what that looks like in code. Oh, wait, I'm gonna show you some stuff. So most of those functions are contained in the HTML module. Um, you import it and then the functions in the HTML model look are, are pretty much have a one-to-one -one match with HTML elements. So there's a div function that returns a div. There's a UL function that returns a UL, li to li, and so on and so forth to all the fun HTML elements you know. Um, each function takes two arguments, a set of attributes and a set of uh, contents, and they nest them just like HTML. So this is what that looks like. So if you want to produce this HTML here, div with a class comment, and the text Elm rocks inside the div. You'd call a div function. You give it two lists. First list is going to have uh, the attribute you want in there, and that's again another function that takes that text as an argument. And then the second one is the context, and text is a function that returns just plain text in there. You can net, and again, you, if you want to nest them, you just put nested functions inside of there. So. Go down like this. So now I have a, U, uh, a UL thing inside the content of the div, and I'll put a bunch of LIs inside, inside of the UL. And so that's basically what your view is going to look like. And you put in variables there and that fill in from your model. Update function. The update function is essentially what you would think of in, in your Rails app as your controller class except it's a function. Um, it takes a model and a message in as arguments, and then outputs an updated version of that model. Um, the message that it takes in is, a, is kind of analogous in a Rails app to the action that you would call on, on within that. And so this is what that would look like. So we'll define a message. Um, this is a particular type in Elm that used to be called a union type, and now they, do like, they call them custom types, but essentially it's how you get to do sort of duct typing in Elm. It means my, I'm gonna, my, my function is gonna take in this type, but this type can be this, or this, or this. And so I'm saying that I have this type called message, and that message might be foo, it might be bar, it might be baz, 
Those can be complex types in there as well. And then I'm going to have a, an, a function whose signature looks like this. It takes that message, model returns a model. I'll use a case statement to go through and, and sort from this. The Elm compiler will enforce that you have handled every case. So if you define a case, a, a type up here, say foo bar baz, and I did not put baz down here, Elm will stop you and say, hey, wait, you forgot to handle this case. If you try to handle a case down here that you have not included up there, Elm will stop you and say, hey, wait, you've got some, you've got, you're trying to do a thing down here, but you didn't tell me what that type is. And so this is, this is one of the reasons why you can't get that undefined is not a function, right? Because it's going to say, no, I, I'm smart enough to know that before I run, I'm going to need to know that. Um, so Elm and Rails, there really isn't any magic to integrating Elm with Rails. You're going to integrate Elm with, Rail, with Rails pretty much the same way that you would integrate any sort of front-end framework like React or Vue or Angular or whatnot. Um, there's a couple of different approaches you can take to doing that. Uh, one is if you have your Elm code in your Elm project all wrapped up inside of your Rails project and have it in the same thing. Um, and you use the asset pipeline or Webpacker or whatever to build those assets just like you would Angular or Vue or React or whatever. Um, this is a good approach if, you're, if, the, if, you're, if the Elm part of your, your app is just a component on, on it within the bigger page and you're still generating most of the page with ERB or whatnot. Um, if your whole front end is essentially going to be written in, in Elm. You're writing like a single page app or a full document, and your web and your Rails side is basically just an API. The approach I particularly like to take is that I do two projects, make your, do the Rails Gen API. It leaves off all that view crap. Do your Elm project over here and distribute them the same. I find this to be a little bit cleaner. Um, either way works fine though. Uh, how are we doing on time, Rich? Time to show, show a little bit of thing. All right, so. If I can escape out of there, there we go. I realize this didn't give you a whole lot of uh, uh, text as to what um, an Elm app actually looked like, and this code is going to be really small but I will make it really big and then I will make that go away. So here is a little uh, app. So here's a little app that I, I wrote that uh, I'll show you in just a second. Um, the whole thing, Elm has enforced uh, styles <laughs> that, that if you the built in that really likes vertical space. Uh, so this whole thing is uh, 184 lines, but if you look at that, that is with a lot of code that normally in many editors you would put on one line broken up into multiple vertical lines. I would say that it's about 50 lines of code in, in this standard thing. So again, here's my main function. Again, it's a browser putting it in elements, so I'm going to assign this to a div in an HTML page that has this record in it, which is an init, view, update, and subscriptions. The subscriptions we're not going to bother with right now. Um, my model, oops, excuse me. My model is really simple. Uh, it's, a, it's a little record that has three things. I, same one I did on the slide. It's a, a string, a tuple, and a, and a list of strings. The initial values of those are nothing, false, and nothing. Um, here's the view. Basically, it's just an HTML page. It's got three, uh, three sections, a, he a header and two sections, uh, with a couple of, of titles and things. And I'll show you what that looks like in the web browser in just a second. And then. Um, a couple of helpers to, to put stuff in there. We'll come back and look at this code if you want, if you want to see it. And then those are some more view helpers. And then the, here's the update message. The update message basic, 
basically I've got four actions that can happen, change the letters, hide the definition, new words, show definition. And here's the actual update function itself where it handles those. Again, it's a case statement that takes in that message and then each one of those case statements change the letters, hide the definition, new words, and show definition. You'll notice that there's actually two versions of new words. It does pattern matching, so new words can, be, have, can come in with a tuple that starts with okay, okay and some value, or it can come in with a thing that says error and some error message, and depending on which one of those happens, uh, I handle both of them. And again, the compiler is really good at catching and making sure that you handle all the cases. Um, Commands, remember commands are how we execute side effects. And so in this case, the commands uh, that we have is get all anagrams and essentially that says call this. This is my Rails app, right? So it's gonna call out my Rails app which uses uh, this nice little RESTful API, get all the words for and then plus send that thing in. And then there's a little JSON decoder here that takes that um, JSON that comes back and pops it into this Elm element that gets sent back up to the, the action. Let's see, and if I go to my browser, hopefully that app is up and going. There you go. This is what that app looks like. Again, here's the three sections, the header, this uh, the section with letters, and the section down below. Um, by the way, it's called Countdown Cheater. It, it doesn't really make sense. Uh, Countdown is a British uh, game show in which uh, they, there's two parts of it, but one part of it is, is they put these letters up on a board and you have to come up with as many word, or the longest word that you can out of the letters that they put, that, that the nice lady puts up on the board. And so this is a way, if you're watching it, to put those letters in and come up with the longest word you can. Um, that's what my, the rail, I have, and the Rails service that this is calling is the, is the one that returns those anagrams, uh, takes those letters and returns the, the words to the page. So. I'll put in some things here. And as I type in things, it, as soon as I get to three letters, it starts calling out. You see it's doing this dynamically um, and returning the uh, letters that come out. And so it works pretty quick, pretty dynamic. And then I don't really trust this Rails app because it's using the Unix word list. And the Unix word list has a lot of things in it that are not words. And so, um, just to make sure that they're words, I have an added thing here, which is where you can click any of them, and it goes out and looks it up in Merriam-Webster and says, yep, that's a real word. And again, that's stretched out 180 lines of Elm code, but in, in actuality, that's a, you know, if you're written in, in normal style, that's about 50 lines in most languages. Questions, comments? Sleeping, bored? Yes. Um, I'm used to like working with you, for example, where it talks about everything sort of being a component. And Elm with the analog be like a module? Okay, a module is the way that Elm code is struck. Okay, I'm I'm sorry. So the answer was is is in Vue and in tools like React, everything is a component. Um, is a mo is an Elm module akin to a component in those frameworks? No. Uh, an Elm module is how you structure your code. It's not necessarily how the code gets rendered in, in the application. So you can use Elm to write individual components. As a matter of fact, you can, a common way that people start sneaking Elm into, uh, or introducing, I'll say, introducing Elm into their work environments is if is a, their React shop, you can write one of your React components and I imagine you could probably do it with Vue as well. I'm not as familiar with Vue. Um, Although Prague Studios has a new thing that's using Vue and Elm, and I bet that they, they're doing that. Uh, they, where you can, you can use Elm to write that component. So again, in Elm, you, Elm has those, those, those layered versions of the application, so you can have an, an, an Elm element which gets assigned to an HTML element on a web page. So in, in, if I were to show you the index.html, you would see that there's a div, and it says inside that div, there's a little line of JavaScript that says, stick the Elm code here. Right, and you can do that with one or more of the of uh, Elm things, so that you can have multiple, so you could use multiple components, or you can do Elm document or Elm application, which basically then says I'm the whole thing. 
The difference being that Elm document basically does a whole web page. Elm application does a whole web page, plus it introduces a router so that you can have URL-based routing similar to like an Ember or a complex Angular app. Uh, that the, the longer version is, it hasn't been edited down yet, but I, what I will do is I, I can put that up on the Ruby list when I get it. Um, also, hopefully by next month, there will be that app that I wrote is actually going to be a Udemy course on how to build that, um, and I'll give out the code to, to uh, the, the PDX Ruby list. So anybody who wants to can check that out. Anything else? Thanks for bearing with me, guys.